It took us a while to talk about the night journey of the Prophet ﷺ to Jerusalem and from there to the seventh heaven, heavens of Allah Azza wa Jal. Once this miraculous night journey ended, the Prophet ﷺ went back to Mecca and it was still night time. So it only took two or three hours, but he had seen what would probably be enough for a lifetime. He came back feeling the comfort and the faith in him that reached its optimum. He felt satisfied of getting the revelations of Allah Azza wa Jal. He felt insured after meeting the messengers and prophets of Allah and being greeted by them and welcomed as a brother and as a son. He came back alayhi salatu wasalam and he told his people, told his followers and told everyone that was around him that he had made this night journey and that it took place in these few hours. The whole of Mecca heard about this and the pagans almost fell to their backs with laughter of this incredible but unbelievable story that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is telling him, telling them. Some of the Muslims that had weak belief and Iman soon rejected Islam and died as non-Muslims because they could not comprehend and understand because they did not have any faith and belief. Other Muslims believed it but still they were not that sure of it because it was so incredible and unbelievable except Abu Bakr. May Allah be pleased with him. The minute that someone came to him and told him that, haven't you heard what your friend says? Haven't you heard what your companions say? So he told them, what was it? The man told him that he claims that he has been resurrected to the heavens and came back passing by uh, uh, Jerusalem in one night, in less than even a one, one night. Immediately, Abu Bakr's response was, that's true, I believe him. And they were astonished. How do you believe such a thing? He told them, come on, this is logical. If I believe that news and instructions from heavens, from Allah Azza wa come to him immediately in a matter of seconds. Don't you be, want me to believe that he went to Jerusalem and to the heavens in one night and came back? Definitely I believe him. And from then, he was known to be Abu Bakr as-Siddiq, which means the one that believes. The pagans wanted to make the best of this because first, they knew, they knew that the Prophet ﷺ had never traveled to Jerusalem in his life. So among them were merchants who've been to Jerusalem for, for a number of times. And of course, one of the greatest structures in Jerusalem is the mosque, the holy mosque of Al-Aqsa. So they wanted to test the Prophet ﷺ. They told him, we're going to ask you questions. So answer them if you had uh, been to Jerusalem as you claim. And the Prophet ﷺ felt a little bit worried because 
he had, had seen the place, but he did not go around it and uh, sightseeing. The many places that we go to, when asked to describe it, it's, hard. It's, diff it's difficult, it's hard. But to his comfort, Allah Azza wa Jal told him not to worry. And he revealed the Holy Mosque of Al-Aqsa to our Prophet ﷺ, as if it's in, in front of him. So they started asking him about little details that only people living there know. And the Prophet ﷺ was looking at it in front of him. And he's describing every single thing, the doors, the windows, the mattresses, the, the, everything. The number of windows. The what? The, the? The number of windows. The on, number of windows, the number of doors, every single thing that no one would take notice of. Even if he went there 10 or 15 or 20 times, the Prophet ﷺ saw it in front of him. Would that be enough to convince the pagans? No, it wasn't. They still insisted on not believing him. So the Prophet ﷺ gave them another example of his truth by saying on my way back we saw a caravan being led by so and so and he named the leader of that caravan coming from a sham coming from the north of Arabia and while coming back they lost one of their camels and they were trying to locate that camel and bring him, bring him back, and they did. And the first camel on this caravan, his colors are so and so, and he looks so and so. Cool. So he give, gave them a detailed description of that caravan. Not only that, the caravan left Mecca about 40 nights ago, and it takes about one month to go and another one to return. So the Prophet estimated, alayhi when, where he saw them, and he told them that they will arrive to Mecca on that particular night, the night of so-and-so. And the pagans anticipated that the given date. And exactly on the same night that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told them, the caravan entered Mecca with the camel that was described to them by the Prophet Sallallahu leading that caravan. So they had no other choice but to believe in the story that the Prophet ﷺ told them. Yet they still insisted with their arrogance not to accept what the Prophet ﷺ had said. Going back to our story, to the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, this night journey has increased his faith more than it was, though it was in the optimum, but it gave them a, a, a vote of confidence that he was on the right track. The Prophet ﷺ, though was under the protection of Mut'am ibn Adi, and still wanted to look for a city, a village, a place that where he would be able to migrate to and find a, a, a peace of mind and find the freedom to call to Allah Azza wa Jal without anybody interrupting him. He kept on presenting his religion to the people in the pilgrims uh, uh, or in the pilgrimage season. And also the Arabs had what they call markets or bazaars. They used to join and gather there for uh, the case of poetry buying and selling, they had this market of Uqad or Souk of Uqad, Souk of uh, 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 that Majaz and, and Majinna and so on. These Souks were attended by a lot, lots of the tribes of Arabia and the Prophet ﷺ used to go to them and present his case, hoping that someone would become a Muslim and give him protection. On and on he used to go alayhi salatu wasalam until it was the 11th year from the first revelation given to our Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. On the 
pilgrim's uh, uh, occasion, on that occasion of pilgrimage, the season of pilgrimage, came men from the tribe of Al Khazraj. And these men were six. But they came from Medina, which was then called Yathrib. It was a 500 kilometer uh, 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 city away from Mecca. But it was a village, but it was a city known for farming and known with the bravery of known of the bravery of its uh, men. Unfortunately, not a while ago, the two main tribes of Yathrib had a clash, had a very big and serious war of Bu'ath, and the Aus and the Khazraj fought together for a very long time, 40 years, maybe 40 years. A lot of the people died. Yeah. The Aus had the prevailing hand, and the majority of dead were from both sides, but from the Khazraj at most. And in the same city or village, there was a number of Jews that came ages and ages ago. The Khazraj, going for pilgrimage, they were talking when... The Prophet ﷺ heard them. So he sought the permission to speak and present his case. So, so they accepted him. And the minute the Prophet ﷺ spoke, they knew that he was saying the right thing, that he was a messenger and a prophet of Allah. How did they know that? The Jews, whenever they had any clash with the Arabs, they used to threaten them and tell them, soon a messenger of Allah will come and we will fight you under his flag and we will annihilate you. We will execute each and every one of you. And they kept on repeating this, repeating this, until the Arabs knew that there definitely there will be a messenger coming and the Jews will fight with him, will fight the Arabs under his flag. So the minute these six men heard the message of the Prophet ﷺ, and they heard the verses of the Quran, they knew that this man is telling the truth and that he is a messenger of Allah. We do have a short break, so please stay tuned and inshallah we will be right back. Philosophy of Islamic Law, a program for restoring belief and trust within Muslims' mind and heart, and for re-establishing a true concept about Islamic rules for others. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. The Prophet والسلام, met those first fortunate six men coming from Yathrib, from the tribe of Al Khazraj. They were fortunate to be among the first to accept Islam. They were fortunate to have met the Prophet. والسلام. They were fortunate because they were so tired of the wars that have claimed so many lives from their tribe and from the other tribe in Yathrib or Medina, which was called Al Aus. They needed someone to unify them and to make these feuds and wars stop and come to, the, to an end. Once they heard from the Prophet والسلام, his presentation of his religion, once they heard the Holy Quran being recited to them, they believed immediately that there is only one God, 
La ilaha illahu, and that the Prophet Sallallahu is his messenger and servant. They immediately turn to him, they have accepted his call, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked them to give him the Pledge of Allegiance. And this was called Bay'atul Aqabatil Ula, which is the first Pledge of Allegiance of Al Aqaba. And what did the Prophet ﷺ ask them to do? He simply, as we were told by one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, the Pledge of Allegiance was to believe in Allah and not to associate any other with Him. And not to steal, not to steal, and not to for fornicate, and not to kill your own children, whether because of the fear of poverty or because of the fear of shame. And we have something nowadays that people call shame killing, or the killing that is caused by feeling ashamed of something. And this they claim when a woman goes out with a man, of course this is forbidden in Islam, her family, the brothers and the fathers, go and kill her. They assassinate her. And this is not permissible in Islam. So the Prophet says, والسلام, that the pledge of allegiance that you do not kill your children and you do not present or come forward with something that is false. And also the Prophet ﷺ uh, took their Pledge of Allegiance not to disobey him in whatever good things he instructed him to do. And, and this is a, a very important criteria. The Prophet ﷺ was not asking them to do something that was evil. There is a hadith where the Prophet says والسلام, that obedience is only in ma'roof. Obedience can happen and must happen only in things that are good. And this also applies to him والسلام, who does not ask us to do anything except ma'roof. And once they accepted this, accepted Islam, and gave the Prophet ﷺ their pledge of allegiance, the Prophet sent with them one of his companions, Mus'ab ibn Umair. Do you know Mus'ab ibn Umair? He was a companion of... He was a companion, but what was he famous of? Mus'ab, the ambassador of Islam. He, he is known to be the first ambassador in Islam because he went to Medina. But before Islam, Mus'ab ibn Umair was one of the most handsomest, the most handsome person, young man in Quraysh. Among the pagans, he came from a noble family. His family was a rich one. And Smart. he was very, very elegant and handsome. To the extent that whenever he passed by an alley, hours later people would know that he passed there from his perfumes. The people of Mecca used to ask to wash his laundry for him so that they would mix it up with their own clothes and the perfume in it would become like something to uh, uh, ma spread the perfume to their dirty clothes when it becomes white and clean again. This man was among the elite of the youth. Every woman in Mecca wanted to marry him because of his elegance, because of his uh, 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 wealth, and because he was a handsome man. The minute Mus'ab ibn Amir converted to Islam, his mother waged a full-scale war on him. She immediately stopped all the financing he used to get. And he didn't care. He didn't mind. All what he was interested in was to be with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Mus'ab ibn Umair, in a number of years, 
was completely transformed to another person. It was reported though in an unauthentic hadith that the Prophet ﷺ saw him being carried between two men because of the weaknesses, because he was so weak of his weakness, he was carried between two men and his skin almost fell off because of the dry atmosphere and the lack of nourishment and food that he used to get. They were surrounded, you remember, in Sha'ab Abi Talib for so long. The Prophet looked at him and said, Subhanallah, look at the difference between five or ten years ago and between now. But nevertheless, Mus'ab ibn Umayr is one of the greatest companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. He sent Mus'ab ibn Umayr, who was knowledgeable with the Qur'an, to Medina with these six men so that he would spread the message of Allah to prepare the floor for him to come and to see their acceptance to uh, uh, this great religion of Islam. Mus'ab ibn Umayr, though was so wealthy when he was young, when he died, it was so tragic. In one, in, uh, in one uh, uh, case or hadith, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, may Allah be pleased with him, was fasting. And then, just as it was sunset, the break for him to break his fast, he was presented with some food. And just about to break his fast, he started crying. And he left the food. He was fasting for 15 hours, 14 hours. And now he's crying, he's unable to eat. So his family told him, what's wrong? He said, I remembered Mus'ab ibn Umayr, who died, who died in the battle of Uhud. Mus'ab ibn Umayr was one of the richest men in Arabia. When he died in Uhud, we tried to wrap him up so that we can bury him. We could not find anything except the garment that was on his body. When we covered his face, his feet showed. And we, when we covered his feet, his face showed. He is better than I am, and now he's dead. And now I'm here sitting and eating. By Allah, I think that Allah Azza wa Jal is giving us our good deeds in this life. And those who are better than us, Allah Azza wa Jal accepted them as martyrs. And he, yeah. he, he kept on weeping and crying and left the food. This is Mus'ab ibn Umayr. May Allah be pleased with him. Mus'ab ibn Umayr went with these six men to Medina. And he started to spread the word of Islam. Mus'ab stayed at the house of As'ad ibn Zurara. Now, As'ad ibn Zurara was a Muslim. And both of them were so keen on calling others to Islam that they were really active. You know, it, it was not a nine to five job. It was their obsession to call people to Islam. So whenever there was a possibility to make da'wah, they would approach it and go to make da'wah to people, calling them to Islam. Their call was a success. And the people of Medina knew that there, were, there was this stranger from Mecca who is delivering da'wah and spreading the message of uh, uh, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Usaid ibn Hudayr and Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh heard about this when As'ad ibn Zurara and Mus'ab ibn Umayr went to call the people for Islam and they stayed with them at one of uh, 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 the gardens or one of uh, the places there. So, Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, who was the head of his tribe, Bani Abd al-Ashhal, and he was from the Aus. He was the head, though he was about 30, 28 years old, that he was a very gallant and strong warrior. He talked to Usaid ibn Hudayr and told him, Usaid, go to 
Asad and to Mus'ab and kick them out of our city. If it weren't for Asad, I would have done this myself, but Asad happens to be my cousin. Sa'ad is saying to Usaid, I cannot go and talk bad to Asad because he is my cousin. Mm -hmm. So you go instead and you talk to Mus'ab and Asad and tell them to stop what they're doing. So Usaid ibn Hudayr, also a strong warrior, took his spear and went to the two to talk to them. And the minute he came in and Asad saw him, Asad told Musab, this is a master of his tribe and he is a strong warrior. So be careful in what you say to him. Because if he reverts to Islam, then this is a great victory. Musab said, it's all in a day's work. No, 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 no problem. What we're doing is doing for the sake of Allah, so I have no problem. And the minute Usaid walked in, he put his spear in the floor and started shouting, swearing, yelling at them. What are you doing? You know, accusing them of things. And they were so calm. They did not do anything to affect that they were trying to show the people. Unfortunately, our story has to come to an end. But inshallah, I promise you that next time we meet, we will go over it again and take the fruits out of such stories. Until then, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.